Hello everyone, welcome back. This is 2-12 Introduction to Planning and Sequencing in the Combat Redstone series. I'm Emin Chun Jun 22 as, as the title suggests. Today I will talk about the planning and sequencing at an introductory level. So without further ado, let's get started. I will start on by introducing you to sequencing first. So what is sequencing? Sequencing is essentially a part of planning. It is essential when we encounter large piston doors or longer piston extenders because it helps us to reduce the moves needed to wire and hence using less space and allow us to compact our belts. It basically also enhances circuit free uh, efficiency and yeah, this also compact our belts uh, further. So that's why sequencing is important. Now, one of the essential principles that sequencing is based on is something called the reuse concepts, which I've already stated it in 2-11 uh, methods of compacting, but then I didn't state it really clearly. So I'll introduce it now, again, because it's more fitting here, to be honest. So reuse concepts, this is. Reuse concept refers to the reusing of circuits within a build. So yeah, it's quite simple. Now, reuse concept is important uh, as we can use one circuit again if we want to perform similar or the same moves. And this also helps us in reducing the volume of a build because we basically reuse a circuit uh, if we want to do some moves similar. We, we want to do some similar moves and by doing so, by reusing the circuits, this basically means that we need one less circuit to wire instead and hence enhance our circuit efficiency. So yeah, that's basically why the reuse concept is uh, useful. And I will now use this uh, flush and seamless quadruple piston extender layout, this powering layout specifically to introduce you on the sequencing knowledge that you should equip. Now, this is kind of weird because all of the inputs are on one side, but uh, I think this actually demonstrates a bit better. Uh, also because I am uh, quite familiar with this uh, layout myself, and the standard layout I'm not actually that familiar with. And also, I guess this also demonstrates a bit better in sequencing, like how you should do it, your sequences. So yeah, that's why I opted for this powering layout. So yeah. Now to construct a, to construct a sequence, there are some steps to follow actually. The first step is to label the inputs for EC identification, which I've already done. So you can see A, B, C, and then the last one here is S. S stands for storage, so yeah, I always use S. So yeah, the second one is to assign moves to obtain a minimum move sequence. So I'll explain what a minimum move sequence is later. The third step is to modify from the minimum move sequence with some principles. So there are a couple of them. Extension replacement principle, full or partial reuse principle the last one will be segmenting or other methods and we modify them because we want to have better reusability so yeah now in this video i'll only talk about one principle that is the extension replacement principle the other principles as you have heard full or partial reuse principle segmenting and other methods will be discussed in 3-3 sequencing so yeah and also for the second step that i have mentioned you need to obtain a minimum move sequence as we get more familiar with creating sequences the development of minimum move sequence is actually not required we essentially can skip some steps and develop our sequences faster rather than every time we have to develop a minimum move sequence but here i will introduce i will still introduce you to the minimum move sequence because uh, it is helpful and I'll explain it more later. So yeah, as I already said, we labeled the inputs. So that's the first step already done. Now I'll introduce some concepts and definitions first. So the second step, as I've mentioned, we should assign moves. So what is assign moves? Well, assigning moves 
refers to the establishment of a sequence by giving suitable moves to power the piston or powering layout. So this is essentially what you have already done in verifying your piston or powering layout. So yeah, you should have already obtained the knowledge for it, but maybe perhaps you're not that familiar. And here I'll just use an example to illustrate it better. Uh, and now the definition of minimum move sequence. So what is a minimum move sequence? It refers to sequences that power piston or powering layout with the least moves possible. So you literally infer it from its name, minimum move sequence. We want to minimize our moves for a sequence. So, yeah. Now, establishing the minimum move sequence is helpful for knowing the essential requirements of the sequence such that it is functional because why would you create a sequence that is not functional? It literally helps nothing. So you, at least what a sequence has to do is that it should be functional. It also prevents us from developing an over-complex sequence due to unnecessary moves. So that's why developing the minimum move sequence is, still has a place. But then it's usually not the final sequence as it often has a low reusability and hence wiring the sequence is inefficient. So yeah, uh, we would always have essentially you always have to modify from the minimum move sequence with some principles so yeah that's the drawbacks of the minimum move sequence but regardless it's still helpful for us to understand the extender or some other piston layouts that we are trying to wire so yeah now uh, by assigning moves we are essentially creating a minimum move sequence so yeah uh, it's just straight up facts and now we st still have to get started. So let's consider the extension of the extender first. So I think it's pretty trivial that we should power A first because we need to start the extender from the back of the extender, of course. Now, although it looks like we can power C directly, uh, doing so would actually not work because of this racing condition. This observer will power the bottom observer instead of the second. Sorry, this observer will power the lowest piston instead of the second lowest piston. Uh, because this uh, and this are one take or two game takes apart. And this means that uh, by raising condition, it will always prioritize the lower piston rather than this piston. So it will always power this first. So raising condition actually creates some annoying stuff for us to handle. Now, the solution to this isn't actually that bad. We can power B first. And then we can power C one tick or two game tick after. Because um, racing condition no longer applies when you have a two tick or four game tick of delay. So we basically power B. And then one tick after, we power C. So this will be two ticks of delay or four game ticks. I will use text as resident text, as I've already said. So, since this has a two tick delay between B, uh, sorry, compared to B, so raising condition no longer applies here. And we can try to see what will actually happen if we try to wire it like such. It still doesn't work. It also makes sense why it doesn't work because we are powering this with a two tick, essentially from this B and C, and then this is part at the same time as this retracts, and this has a priority to retract first. So, yeah, it retracts. Okay. Now this means that we still need to power this longer. Guess what? We can power B again because we by doing a double pulse essentially. We are making a free tick pulse or six game tick pulse for the second highest piston. And this gives sufficient uh, pulse length for the second lowest piston to extend at this level. So we can essentially do something like this and it will work like so. So yeah, that's that solved. And yeah, 
And also, I guess it's a nice habit for us to write down our moves. So I'll just write it in vertical form. I'll later just uh, tidy it up. So A, we have B2, and then C1 tick or 2 game tick. Okay. So we currently have this. And then, now what we do? We need to push this observer to part this right, but then we need to retract this piston up. So now we do that. How do we do it? Uh, here, you can actually part B or C. I will tell you that you should part C for later reasons. But then either way, uh, we will still come to the same conclusion. So yeah, for now, just let you know you should part C. Okay. Now, there are a lot of different ways to retract the stack, actually. Uh, so, we have multiple ways of doing so. We can do... Uh, A, and then B. That works. Or, we can do double pulse A. So that also works. And yeah, let's keep that in mind. We have two possibilities. Then we have A, B, or A2. Like so. And now the observer comes in. We part two, C two times, and then the S will retract. So A, B, or A2. Then we have S, C, C, I'll just do two Cs, S, like so. And now we need to retract the lowest piston back up for the retraction. So what do we do? We basically repeat ourselves a lot of moves. So we repeat the in uh, initials by A, and then we have the same thing. We have the B, two, and then C, with one tick or two game tick delay, like so. Now this time we need to actually do a double pulse on C. That's why I tell you that you should power C here, because we do a double pulse now on C, so. Let me just uh, do that. So, like so, that works. So let's write down A, B, two, C with this specific delay, and then C, two. Okay, now how do we retract it? So, we have multiple ways. We can have A and then B, two. So A will do this, and then B2 will do a double pulse like this. So A and B2 works. We can also do A2, and then we have two options. We can power B at a specific timing. We can also power C with a not specific timing. So there are many options, so let's just write them all down. So A, B2, that's the first option. Or... A to C, that's the second option. The third option is the timing of B, so A to and then B4 tick or A game tick. That's the precise delay that we need, so yeah. We have three options, so yeah, and this will be the extension fully done. And now we will consider the retraction. Well, we basically repeat ourselves quite a lot and it's actually sufficient for us to repeat everything before the observer retracts. Yeah, until the observer retracts. So we do what? A and then B2 and C thing. And then we have C. So, yeah. 
these four completed. And then we have A, B, S, C, C. I'll just use this double pose because it also works. And then S, like so. So these can be all copied directly. Like so. All right. Now what do we do? We do essentially the same thing. Now we do this. Yes, this also works. It also grabs it. Now the problem lies in that we need to power this bottom piston while also having this retracted upwards. So what do we do? We can push this observer here, but then that's not efficient. So we can try something special. Just do a double pulse on C. Let's see what will happen. And surprisingly, it extends this pist the lowest piston and also gets retracted upwards. So why is that? Well, we can consider some timings. So the first pulse, let's say zero. Here, zero to one, one to two. But then this has the priority to retract this here. So this will update this. So this power is starting from one, but because there are no updates, so this will retract at 2.5 and now retract at 2.5 means uh, actually hang on uh, so 0 to 1 and then 1 to 2 this gets updated so this powers at 2 to 3 okay so this gets power at 1 and it will finish power at 2 so this can update it essentially. Now notice that this power is from 2 to 3, but then there are no updates for this block here. So what will happen then? Uh, it basically stays powered until this updates this. Well, not really, but then uh, it powers at 2, and then it would self-update only at 3.5, and by that time, this will already be retracted, or it will be ready to get retracted. So yeah, this retracts at 2, and then it will finish, its, it, will, it can be retracted at 3.5, and this will retract at 3.5, so this also retracts, so that's why this works, so yeah, uh, some slightly more complex timing stuff, uh, but uh, yeah, we still managed to see why this works, so yeah, that is the timing aspects uh, explained here, so luckily we can just basically repeat ourselves like this. Now the final thing is that we need to do some stuff to power this, retract here, and power it again. So how do we do it? Um, yeah. Now, there are some solutions to this. Uh, but then let's just consider the difficulties first. What we need to do, so let's just say we power A. Okay. So we can power C here, except no, not really because uh, that. So let me just do Obsidian. We can, we can power C here actually, to be honest. 
Uh, but then we actually have some better alternatives. But also keep notes that if we part B now, then if we part C now, this will actually only retract this instead of having this to be extended. So if we decide that we should part A first, then we will need to have something such that um, we will power C even though this piston might be here. So the best way to do this is to use timings again. Now, let me explain. We can power B, and then one tick after, we can power C. So, very similar to what we have did before. And actually, if we do that, it literally works. So, let's just explain the timings again. The reason for that is because this powers, and then of course this will retract, and then 0 to 1, 2 to 3. Okay, 2 to 3, this powers. And this also powers at 2 to 3. So this, this powers, and then they retract at the same time. So this cannot be retracted, like so. And then finally, we can just do C2, like so. So yeah, although at here, we can do perhaps maybe AC, like so. But then we actually have a better alternative which is that we power A and then we repeat ourselves with the B2 and then C thing like so and then we just do C2 so yeah timing wise it is doable so yeah now of course there are also other alternatives for example we can just do A double pulse and then power C at 3 ticked or 6 game tick of delay. So let's just write that down first. A, B, 2, C. Or A, 2, C, B, tick, or 6 game tick. Yeah. Uh, That's the first option, A2, C, 3 tick, or 6 game tick. The last option, I guess, if you want to consider it A, C, B2. So that's the last option. And then finally we do C2. So yeah, that will be the retraction minimum move sequence, essentially. And yeah. We basically did it. The extension and retraction minimum move sequence. Notice that both of them are different. So yeah. And now that we have established our minimum move sequence, uh, what do we learn? Well, we learned the general approach to powering the extender and also some required powering methods. For example, this B2 and then C1 tick or two game tick delay. So this is a very specific powering method. And yeah, now we can start to simplify the sequence. So here comes the principle that is very important. This is the extension replacement principle. So it states that for extenders that spell the block during extension, for example, this one, two, three, four, it will literally spell the block like this. We can use the retraction sequence as the extension sequence. So what does this mean? We can scrap all of this, although I want to still keep it. We can scrap all of this. And have the retraction sequence to replace the extension sequence. like so. So yeah. In fact, this means that we can simply consider the retraction sequence 
when creating sequences for such extenders. Hence, you see why I say the minimum move sequence, sometimes we can literally skip it because we can literally just consider the retraction without the extension. And it still works. You can verify it. Like, yeah, let's do that. So A, B, 2, C, C. A, B, 2, C, that also does it, C. And then A, B, S, C, C, S, S, C, C, S. A, B, 2, C, C, 2. A, B, 2, C, C, 2. And then A, B, 2, C, C, like so. Yeah, it works. Now, showing that showing you this works is fine, but I think it's, it's more important to explain to you why it works. Now, notice that what is the difference between an extension and a retraction? The extension, all it, what it needs to do is to place this piston down there, power it, or like so, and then retract only the lowest piston. What does the retraction need to do? Same thing initially, to push this lower piston down here, power this, and then retract not only the lowest piston, but also every single time the lowest piston gets retracted, it also needs to pull up this block. So what this means is that retraction is only doing more stuff than the extension. It has to retract the block all the way up. And that's the extra thing that the retraction is doing compared to the extension. So we can safely say that the retraction sequence will also work for the extension sequence because the retraction sequence is essentially the sequence that guarantees you that it will retract the lowest block. But then what it also guarantees already is that it retracts the lowest piston. So both of the sequences already does the lowest piston. And that's why we can replace the retraction sequence. Oh, sorry, replace the extension sequence with the retraction sequence. So yeah, that's basically that. And yeah, you can basically apply it in many extenders, literally, I can tell you. In fact, the exercises will also tell you to use the extension replacement principle. But yeah, anyway, so yeah. Now, we applied the extension replacement principle very cool. And that is supposed to be the only part, sorry, the only principle that will teach you. But then I still want you to know more, at least. So the following knowledge will be formally introduced uh, in 3 3 sequencing. But then I'll still include it here just for a full reference. So, yeah, now we notice the similarity between the first and the last part of the sequence. So, what's the first part of the sequence? Let me just label it. Here. First part is here, and the last part is here. So, what is this? Um, we see A, B, 2, C, C, 2. Here is A, B, 2, C, C instead of C, 2. And then what is this? Uh, it's quite messy, but essentially we'll, we have A, B, 2, C. Here is sorry, A, B, 2, C, C, 2. And then here is A, B, C, 2. So yeah, we... Notice that the last part is very similar to the first part. Now, why is that? Again. Uh, the reason is exactly the same. Except at some different point of view. Which is that the first part of the sequence, all you need to do is to position the lowest piston here. 
the last part of this piece of the sequence not only has to position the piston, well, it basically retracts the piston upwards, but it also needs to pull these, these blocks again. So what it does is more than the first part of the sequence, obviously. The first part only needs to put the lowest piston at the correct level. The last part of the sequence has to retract the piston at the correct level and also power the lowest piston every single time it gets pulled up. So that's the fundamental difference. So again, it's the same thing. The last part of the sequence is doing exactly the same thing as the first part of the sequence, but even more. So that's why the similarity. And hence, what we can do is to replace the first part of the sequence with the last part of the sequence. It's literally that. Yeah, we are replacing things over and over again. So yeah. Uh, say goodbye. Now, uh, don't replace the SCCS though. Uh, there is no way, to, no space to write this down. So just A, B, two, C, one take, two game take, A, two, C, three tick, four, six game tick, four, A, C. And then we have the C2, but then we need the S to be to make the C2 in between the two S's. So, yeah. We basically can replace it like that. So, yeah. That's nice. Now, the last thing we can optimize is, again, we also notice similarities, but at a different point of view. What do we notice from here? We have A, B, 2, C, C, 2. We don't care about the delay now. We just care about the moves. A, B, 2, C, C, 2. And then what do we have here? Well, we have some options. But look at the first option. A, B, 2, C, C, 2. So same thing here, A, B, 2, C, C, 2. We have other options, A, 2, C, or A, C, B, 2. Yeah, but that is not that similar to this. If we want to enhance our reusability, what should we use? Well, obviously, we should use some moves that we already have and we need to wire which means we should select A, B, 2, C, C, 2 here. So the first option should be selected. And hence, we will choose this instead. So A, B, 2, C, write down the delay, S, C, 2, S. Same thing, this is, there we go. So, yeah. And now, we finally have a sequence that looks very nice to wire because we always have this A, B, 2, C, C, 2 thing here. And then, only during the second iteration do we have the two S's that has a C2 in between it. So we just need a toggle, so that's fine. And yeah, and then we repeat these, this thing two times. So all in all, what we have essentially created is A, B2, C. This is the way that I like to write sequences, by the way. So we have S, S, C2 in between. So we have this very nice wiring or sequence here. So we just do A, B to C, C2, essentially four times, times four. And then we have S here. So S, 
we can note that this is the second iteration, like so. So yeah, we have a very nice sequence that we have we developed, and yeah. So this uh, uh let me just write that down. So this is extension. for extension replacement principle and then this is the extension after of course and then the retraction so it's the same thing and then we have this is uh, on noticing patterns noticing patterns on we have noticing patterns too. So you can see how we can modify our sequences, which is that first we use the extension replacement principle to get rid of this uh, extension uh, sequence to be equivalent to the retraction sequence. So now we can only we only need to consider one of them. And then by noticing patterns, we would see uh, that we should opt um, let me see. Yeah. Uh, by noticing patterns, we should see that we should replace the first part of the sequence with the last part of the sequence because the last part is just doing exactly the same thing as the first part of the sequence except it's doing more. So click replace it like so and then finally we see that a b 2 c c 2 is commonly used so we should select a b 2 c c 2 for here for these two so two steps of noticing patterns later we finally concluded this very beautiful sequence so yeah that's essentially the whole step of doing sequences demonstrated here although the noticing patterns here i will introduce you more in 3-3 sequencing uh you still get a gist of what i'm trying to do so yeah good for you for watching this part if you don't understand it's still fine because i'll also introduce you to this in 3-3 sequencing along with some uh very complex yet clever methods i guess so yeah anyway so now we have succeeded in uh, establishing our sequence we should now get on to the next part which is the introduction to planning so when we create a complex piston door planning is essential while well, sequencing is one part of it as it prepares us with the knowledge and basic circuits for construction. So yeah, every time you try to create a complex piston door, it's best for you to plan or otherwise you'll mess something up and you have to restart it, which is not good, right? So yeah, plan things up, uh, general guidelines. So yeah, uh, anyways, planning has many aspects as well. So we have the aspects of uh, planning before we are we start wiring we also have planning when we are wiring so here i would just uh, focus on the planning before we start wiring the planning during wiring is actually uh, also overlaps with some pre-wiring stuff but then uh, yeah those will be uh, quite a bit more complex than uh, what i'm going to introduce you uh, in this video so let me just talk about some planning steps that you should involve uh, before you wire your piston doors so there are six steps here one is to decide on the piston layout i mean yeah of course because you need a piston layout in order to wire a piston door <laughs> because where would you start otherwise so yeah wiring your piston door this technique is already introduced in 1-12 configuration of piston layouts and perhaps a bit more in 2-11 methods of compacting. So yeah, refer to those videos if you still need some fundamental knowledge, but you should have equipped with sufficient knowledge now already. 
Step two is to create a powering layout based on the piston layout. I have taught you this in 2-11 methods of compacting. So, yeah. And I guess also just now, assigning moves is essentially verifying if your powering layout works or not. And yeah. Although there are also some actual methods on wiring a powering layout. Uh, those will be in 2-11 already, so just check that out. If you are still unsure, summon knowledge. The third step is to establish sequences, which I literally did it just now. So, yeah, there you go. The fourth step is to build small useful circuits and input joints. Fifth step is to figure out the circuit flow. And the last step is to position the input. So the fourth to the sixth step are the steps that I'm going to teach you in this video. Now, as I already said, there are other planning knowledge, and they will be discussed in 3-2 planning. I cannot fit in all planning knowledge within one video, otherwise it will be too long. Not like this is not long enough. So, yeah. Uh, we will discuss on steps 4 to 6 uh, one by one. So step 4 is to build some small useful circuits and input joints. So let's go ahead and focus on this extender again to see how we can create uh, these input joints. So we based on this uh, sequence of course. This is the nice sequence that we developed after a long discussion. So there are three input joints that we can consider. We have A to B2, we have B2 to C, and then we have C to C2. S we don't consider because it's on the top. So yeah. Now A to B2 should be a trivial one. All you need to do is to just think of some solutions that can that on one side will give a single pulse to A, and then on the other side give a double pulse to B, while maintaining a suitable delay. The suitable delay is at least 2 ticks or 3 game ticks. Because pistons power at every 3 game ticks, basically. Or, it like, it pistons power to be stable. Yeah. At least three game six, and four game six sufficient enough. So yeah. So like this, this will already work. So yeah, this will be a nice input join already. So we have A and B two already. Now the careful thing is that we also need to pop wire from B two to C with this timing constraint. And this is the hard part. The hard part, besides timings, is also another thing. That is also related to planning, which is that notice C comes with C2. C and C2 have to be of sufficient delay, of course. And we see that both these moves power C. So we have to be careful here. Why? Because we need to leave space to power C2 afterwards. And if we wire B2 to C with an isolated circuit, that means we can no longer uh, power C2. So this is free. Uh, so, let's just suppose Yeah. 
Let's just suppose that we have something like this. Although this is not a really perfect example. But yeah, anyway. So let's just suppose that you cannot power this piston from anywhere else would be besides this subset. So this will cause problems because you cannot power C2 anymore. And yeah, if you cannot power C2, then you basically block yourself. You cannot do anything. So we basically have to wire things very carefully if we have some moves that are the same as the other because we don't want to block ourselves from wiring it. So that is the important part that I have to say to you, although the example is not exactly perfect. But yeah, that's the thing that we have to be caution about. So uh, I'll leave that for now. Well, actually, I'll just leave that. Uh, and I'll focus on C and C2. Because all you need to do is just to consider the timings and to avoid um, any uh, isolation. And later, the C and C2 input joints or a small circuit that I'll build will actually help you to uh, resolve the possible constraining issue. Now, as I've already said that C and C2 have to have sufficient delay, so we can just basically do any small circuit that uh, suits our needs. So what would be a good circuit if we have C here and C2 here? It's basically a single pulse on one edge and then a double pulse on the other edge. So what would be a good circuit? Single double pulse generator, of course. So this should be introduced in miscellaneous circuits if you have remembered it well. This. Simple, right? You can alternatively do some other things like this as well although it's a bit larger. So I'll just do this here. And yeah. Since we will need sufficient delay, so it doesn't matter how long this resets, as long as it works, it is fine. And we only care about the compactness of the circuit. So yeah, who cares? So yeah, this works. Because if we see here, uh, let's just suppose that this here. Ours, like so. So it does a single pulse like this. And then later it will do a double pulse like this. So single pulse, double pulse like this. Yeah, and then double pulse like this. Like so. So yeah, it works quite well, I would say. And look, notice another thing. It resolves the isolation issue. Why? Because this piston is going to be able to receive from multiple uh, locations unless you fully block it in some magical ways. So yeah, this piston can receive from a lot of places as input. So. All you need to make sure is that you have a component that can receive from multiple areas. And this will resolve the issue where you have full isolation and blocking yourself from wiring any further. So yeah, that's the important thing. Actually, this is a concept that I will introduce in 3 Roll Redstone Analysis. Although I'm going to introduce you now because I think it's also quite important to just note you on... Uh, some input joins, uh, cautions, I guess. So yeah, I'll just leave the B2 and C uh, because you can just wire using timings. I don't really care. But yeah, essentially, uh, it's just to raise your awareness on how to build input joins while we look at the sequence and we see whichever is, if this is easy for us to do so. If it's not easy for us to do so, don't do input joins, I would say. Just wire them separately so this is an e easy one to do and we also need to be caution on some peculiar stuff so for example if we are going to fully isolate ourselves if we are going to be then we need to be careful not to do so 
So this will be a good way because this piston can receive from multiple areas, multiple blocks. So yeah. And small circuits will be, for example, the C and C2. This is a very nice single double pulse generator, which is a small circuit that you can use for doing C and C2 because they just basically alter between each state. So yeah. That's why creating sequence is important as well because you can plan on some input joints which can, which can further enhance your uh, circuit efficiency. So yeah, that's basically that. And I probably talk a bit long about the input joints and small circuits. So let's move on to step five. Step five is what? Circuit flow. We will use another example because we can't really use this. There's a better example which is here. So let's just let me just explain what this is going to do. So we have the left extend left slider that fires, and then we have this bottom thing that does is double actually, like so during closing. And then the opening, the top will push one block down here, and then this will do its stuff. And then we have the double extender like this, and then finally the right slider piston will push it back for seamlessness. So you can consider this as like a five by five uh, frame like so. So yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, let me introduce you a principle that helps you understand what circuit flow should be following. So this is the circuit flow principle. It says that circuit flow should be designed in chronological order with pistons or circuits or sequences. Well, chronological order basically just refers to whichever powers first. Basically timing wise. Now, to understand why the above principle makes sense, let's just think of what happens if we don't follow the, exam, the, the principle. The principle basically asks us to why the left first, then the bottom double, then the right. What if we try to, I don't know, start with the right side first, then what will happen? <clears throat> Well, basically what you would do is that since this has to happen first and we are at the right, so uh, whoops, we need a signal transmission circuit back here, up here, like so. And then uh, instead of this, let me just make it better like this, maybe, I don't know. Then later, we will have this maybe yeah I'm not sure it probably is not enough delay actually yeah maybe like this I don't know then later we will have To be honest, now this regard if it works or not, it's just an example. Yeah. And then after this, and then we need to do another signal transmission back here, which is a bit more complex since we have already ob uh, obstructed this with this block here. So maybe we need to do this. something like this so yeah it's quite weird like so maybe maybe yeah although this won't work because that will detect things so whoops I guess this will work I guess so yeah, basically we will have some very wacky stuff like this. So what? Do, so where is the conclusion here? Well, let's just see what happens actually. Also, this is supposed to be here. We wire it starting from the right, and then you go back to the left. That is one signal transmission circuit, literally right right here. And then 
Notice that we still have to wire from the left to the right, essentially. It doesn't really do anything. So, we have a signal transmission circuit from here to here, like so. I made it very small because I can do so, but then probably some of you might not be able to do efficiently. So, you might have some very uh, messy wiring like this, and no one wants that. Also, this is a clock. I love how I built a clock accidentally. So, yeah. You might have some extra signal transmission circuits, which is not really that good, right? We are concerned about our circuit efficiency and the compacting methods. So, having this many signal transmission circuits probably isn't to our good, but to our worst. So, how should we improve this then? Well, by following the circuit flow principle, obviously. And yeah, that's why it makes sense, because we reduce our need of um, transmission circuits by following the circuit flow principle. Yes, that's what you get if you don't follow it. You will end up with a lot of signal transmission circuits which are not necessary. So by following the circuit flow principle, you'll basically have a very good time. So all you need to do is just do this. And then here, it's a bit more weird because we need to power this while also maintaining this here. So all you need to do is to... <clears throat> Perhaps like this. Wire things like this. And then wire stuff like this. Do the same thing again. So all we need now is one signal transmission circuit. Like so. See? So we basically loosen up all these this space that we previously used a signal transmission circuit just to connect from the right to the left so how efficient is that and yeah you can see the fundamental difference or the significant difference i should say and yeah follow the circuit flow principle just saying and it should be pretty obvious why so yeah Hopefully you will understand that. It shouldn't be a hard principle to understand. But just to give you a detailed example. Yeah, there we go. Alright. Now, finally, step 6. What is step 6? We need to decide on how to do the input location. We have another principle to follow. This principle is slightly more complicated because it also relies on our professional judgment, but I'm still going to say it. Uh, to determine the input position, we should place it in a position that maximizes our benefits, of course. And the benefits include several things. Matching circuit flow, or catering sequences, or reducing wiring difficulty and increasing wiring efficiency, or reduce the build volume, or resolving landlock issues. Five things. Obviously, there might be more, but uh, yeah, I think these five things should be sufficient for your consideration. And as I said just now, landlock issues. What is landlock issues? Well, the concept of landlock will be introduced in 3 4 redstone analysis. It's essentially this, uh, a similar situation to isolation of the circuit here. But uh, yeah, I will talk more about that in 3 4 Resto Analysis. So make sure to check that out if you are interested. So anyways, there are five things that we can consider. Well, let's just use some examples to illustrate what I mean by that. Now, if we take a look at this example, since I've established that uh, we should wire from the left to the bottom double to the right. So... A good input position will be on the left, right? This is to match our circuit flow. 
BS by putting it on the left, we eliminate the need of transmission circuit from the right to the left if, you, if we intend to place it on the right, which why would you do so? So yeah, placing it on the left, a nice choice. And yeah, that is to match our circuit flow, essentially. Now, this, uh, as I said, uh, the input should be placed on the left. But then, if you notice earlier, I said throughout the video, that this uh, layout is actually used in conjunction with the top layout. So we have a problem. The top layout will push the block one block down. And this pushing has a timing dependency. This means that the top has to happen first before the bottom. What does this mean? We should wire the bottom with delay. And hence, if we choose to have the input location at the bottom, we need to transmit back to the top first. And this creates more transmission wiring. So uh, no, that is not optimal. If you're considering the top layout as well, we should actually position our input at the top. So yeah, again, matching circuit flow. It's just that how many circuit flow or how many pistons circuits we need to consider. If we consider only the bottom, then yeah, obviously we should wire it here. But then if we also consider the top, well, we need to wire it from the top. It's still preferred. Although in some rare situations, you might not follow this, but then usually you will. So, yeah. Now, this is the consideration of matching circuit flow. Let's consider some other examples like this 3x3 piston door layout, which has been more popular since 1.16. I'll explain why. Now, to reduce volume of this, what can we do? Now, previously, before 1.16, we need to place a block in order to power all these three pistons. But now we don't. We can place it on top of the middle piston because powering this and then retracting this won't break the lever anymore. So we can do that now. And by placing this lever here, this also reduces the block required at this position, and hence this reduces our volume. So yeah, input position selection principle, one, uh, one selection criteria is to reduce the build volume. And this is one perfect example to illustrate how we can reduce the build volume by choosing an appropriate uh, position of input, which is literally right here. So very cool, very nice. And yeah. So that is another criteria uh, given with example. Mm, there are two more examples. Uh, there are five criteria, but I'll only have four examples because the Lanark issue is not going to be introduced until 3-4. Now, the examples of reducing wiring, efficient, uh, wiring difficulty and increasing wiring efficiency or catering sequences can be found in 1-5 input methods. It's an introductory level course, but then I already introduced some advanced level uh, knowledge in there. The two examples at the end are literally knowledge of input position considerations. So yeah, you can feel free to check that out. And those examples, I will have a further video explaining some concepts that I didn't cover in that video. Uh, they will be covered in 3-2 planning. So yeah, don't worry. I'm still going to formally uh, introduce more concepts and knowledge to you from those examples. So yeah, and speaking of which, the useful resources I have provided for you will be 1-5 input methods, so check out those two examples, and also the videos on 3-2, 3-3, 3-4 planning, sequencing, and resting analysis, uh, respectively. So yeah, those are going to be uh, your useful resources. And yeah, so 
Yep, that's it for the knowledge uh, part. So I'll go on to the exercises. So there are four of them this time. I want to uh, mention a bit uh, regarding some, well, each question, because there are some things I want to give note to you before you start actually doing them. So this one is has a probably is the hardest one actually. Uh, it asks you to build three suitable inputs and necessary input joints for the setup. So I limited uh, due to three inputs because I want you to incorporate the idea of building input joints to minimize your input uh, numbers, basically. Because you can have a lot of inputs and it will be not efficient to wire with a lot of inputs, right? So I limit you to three inputs and I want you to use some input joints to wire it. Uh, to connect them such that you can minimize your input numbers and yeah name the inputs however you like I don't really care uh, and yeah uh, let's go on to the next page so derive the minimum move sequence so for the both extension and retraction so yeah and asking you if the sequence is fully reusable now this question should basically have a lot of different solutions so the one that I've suggested to you is basically a suggested answer you can have different answers to be honest so yeah it's just for you to practice on some input join methods I guess and also the knowledge on how to position your inputs uh, precisely so yeah I guess that is the main point of this exercise this probably is the first open open-ended question probably well not really except those uh, you know piston door uh, questions. The next two questions are very similar. It's basically a practice for you to derive the minimum se move sequence first, and then uh, the extra part is to identify the parts of the sequence that is reusable. Now, notice that this is actually different from this here. Is the sequence fully reusable? What I'm asking for this question is if the extension is can be reused in the retraction or can the retraction be reused in the extension so essentially it's more of a more of a is extension equivalent to retraction question this is different this is asking you if there are any parts during the extension or any parts during the retraction that has the same moves so you may have in the retraction A, B, C, A, B. Then A, B will be the sequence or the moves that is reusable. And you may have some very weird stuff for extension. So A, B, C for extension, retraction A, B, C, A, B, for example. So if we t consider retraction, then A, B is the part that is reusable. So yeah, that's basically the idea that I'm trying to ask you. So apply the extension replacement principle and revise the sequence. This should be a very simple question because copy and paste. Uh, the fourth and the fifth question, uh, this only has the fourth question actually, uh, are going to be interesting questions. So the fourth one here is a planning question. So uh, there will also be a planning question in exercise 1.3. So this is asking you if building an input joint is suitable. So there's a planning uh, question. I didn't really uh, teach you exactly the reasoning, but then I hope that you can use your senses to answer this question. It's basically a critical thinking skill. And 12.3, same thing, middle move sequence, identify reusable parts, apply extension replacement principle, so yeah, basically some practices that helps you to get familiar with the sequence establishing knowledge. So the fourth question here is to compare the reusability, actually. So using some reuse concept uh, statements and yeah, and using again some common sense, I guess. And yeah, you can identify if one sequence is better than the other, essentially. And lastly, this is a planning question. So asking you, where should you place your input? 
or yeah, which side? Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically the same. So, yeah, uh, just apply some planning knowledge that I've introduced you earlier. And then the last one is a purely planning question. So, crack on door. This gets heated up for a while. So there are only two questions here. So asking you the circuit flow and where should you place the inputs again? So yeah, just refer to the knowledge that I've uh, introduced you in the planning section and you should be fine. So yeah, good luck with the exercises and I hope you learned something from the exercises as well. Uh, and also throughout the video as well. And yeah, uh, once again, thank you for your patience. Uh, uh, because it takes quite a lot while for me to make these videos and I hope uh, it delivers the best quality So that's why it's that long and yeah, thank you for your patience once again and as always the work download uh, The documents and the solutions will be in the drive folder as always provided and also some at the back as well so for this one the inputs here and then for that one the input position is also provided so they are always going to be provided so yeah, you can check them out and do the exercises yourself so yeah this is going to be probably the final course on the intermediate topic series this is, does not mean that it is the final video of the intermediate uh, topic series but uh, for the courses this probably is the final one uh, just to mention on uh, some future aspects uh, for the introductory and intermediate levels, I will probably do some guides. Uh, the guides will be based on some piston doors, and I will apply the concepts that I've introduced throughout the courses to introduce you some knowledge that you should consider when wiring your piston doors, and to help you familiarize with the final uh, achievement assessment part. So, Achievement assessment part will be basically some piston doors that I want you to wire uh, by yourself. Uh, I'll provide you some hints, basically. And yeah, uh, as always, if you have any questions regarding the exercises or, you know, on the later ones, how, uh, how exactly you want to wire your piston doors, if you have any general questions, and if you want some pointers or, hint or, or hints, just feel free to ask me. Uh, in Discord or in YouTube comments, it doesn't really matter. So, yeah, once again, thank you all for your support, and I will see you in those guides, or the achievement assessment videos, or in the advanced level courses. So, yeah, I will see you in the next video.